For your awards consideration, Euphoria, the Emmy Award-winning HBO original series starring Zendaya, follows a group of high school students as they navigate love and friendships in a world of drugs, sex, trauma, and social media. Don't miss the performances praised by Decider, who says the whole cast is phenomenal. Watch the series the Chicago Sun-Times calls bold and original and searing and brutally raw. Euphoria is now streaming on HBO Max. Welcome to In the Envelope a podcast from Backstage, the one-stop shop for actors and creators both above and below the line. I am your host, Vinny Mancuso, Backstage Senior Editor and Professional Entertainment Obsessive. I'll be your guide through every corner of the creative industry with the help of some of your favorite stars. Here you'll find intimate, in-depth talks with today's most award-worthy names in film, television, and theater. Along the way, we'll get advice on living your best creative life, relatable stories of the highest highs and lowest lows, and maybe, just maybe, a rare peak in the envelope. I don't feel really that much shame when it comes to performing, but having to answer questions about myself it's just, it's such a different experience yeah. and you feel so under the microscope and then there's such a, like, a wave of self-loathing that comes along with that, where I think a lot of us actors, we're really doing this just to escape ourselves. Welcome to In the Envelope, the actor's podcast, and welcome to a whole dang new year. It is 2023. I am your host, as always, backstage senior editor, Vinny Mancuso. We did it. We all did it. We made it to a new year, hopefully in one piece. And joining us to celebrate is someone who is basically a friend of the podcast at this point, uh, the incredible Olivia Cook. If you are a dedicated In the Envelope listener, uh, you know Olivia joined us almost one year ago today already. But what this episode is going to show you very clearly is how much a working actor's life can change in just one year. Uh, As you might remember, House of the Dragon, a show you may have heard of, debuted back in August, became HBO's biggest show ever, and nabbed both a second season and some hefty SAG ensemble buzz. Now, as a standout of that very, very talented ensemble, uh, Olivia had a ton to talk about today. Uh, Her truly, truly wild audition process that went on forever, Uh, some on-set stories, finding her chemistry, her truly delightful chemistry with Emma Darcy, She just had a lot to talk about, especially as she starts to make room in her brain to think about season two and the award seasons to come. Let's get right into it. Here is Olivia Cook. How are you doing? Thank you so much for being here. This is this is incredible. Oh, no, thanks for doing it so close to the holidays and all that malarkey. How, where are you at the moment? Uh, I'm in New Jersey. Um, okay. so it's, a, it's a brisk 10 a.m. right now, um, mm. which is, you know, I think the best time to do an interview, you know, just hop online, talk to somebody. Uh, yeah. I, how are you doing as we uh, barrel towards the end of the year? I feel snoozy. <laughs> the proper snoozy. Um, it's been a bit of a mad year, so I'm like quite happy for it to be over. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, are you the type of person who makes a, uh, a resolution of any kind? Oh, yeah, I am. My resolution this year was so stupid and so trivial. It was like to be able to do the splits. <laughs> and I end. sort of like did that in earnest for two weeks and then just gave it up. What I feel like I feel like that's the best kind. It's not like a big life changing thing. It's like <laughs> if you if I could put my mind to this, what else, you know, I could do anything. Um, yeah, I was like, what's manageable right now with my very <laughs> limited headspace? And I was like to do the splits and I couldn't even do that. <laughs> but you tried. You tried, <laughs> tried and that's honestly what's important. Well, um, I yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I think my New Year's resolution is honestly to like stress a little bit of a little bit less about this podcast because mm-hmm. um, the chats are always lovely. Um, you know, I've, I I think this is like my 30th episode uh, yeah. and they've all been wonderful. So I don't know, maybe just uh, not freak out about it. Uh, th- I think every time I do an episode, I'm like, this is the one that's going to go horribly wrong. 
you know, like it, after I could, I could do 50, 50 of the most lovely chats of my life, but I'm like, this is the one where somehow, somehow it goes horribly wrong. Uh, so yeah, let's, let's make this one, not the one that goes <laughs> yeah. horribly wrong. Just like have our chemistry be really off. And like <laughs> exactly. storm yeah. out I guess I shouldn't have said that at the beginning. Like, let's, <laughs> let's see, let's see how this one goes. Um, but yeah, you know, I, we were just saying that, uh, I'm I'm really glad to talk to you now, specifically because you know you are a, actually a rare return guest to this podcast, and I think we had you on um, almost exactly a year ago or just over a year ago. Um, but a lot has changed <laughs> in yeah. in that one year, and I think it's really valuable for you know a lot of our listeners to see how you know what changes in in one year of uh, the life of a working actor. So um, yeah, I guess just to start off, um, looking back. How has this year been? What has changed for you? How do, when you sort of look back on everything that's happened, uh, how does yeah, it feel? It's been, it's been such an odd year because usually my years are defined by like the projects I've done and where I've been and what I've worked on and who I've worked with. But this has just been like an extension. I did a film called Mother's Milk um, with a, a director called Miles Joris Perifit, um from like May to June, but that was so quick. But since we wrapped House of the Dragon in February, it's just been one extended press tour mm-hmm. for the whole year. And I've never experienced anything like that. I never thought about a project after the fact so much. Um, and also discovered things about the characters and the story after <laughs> I filmed yeah. it. And continued to discover things about the show. Um and which are, you have to, because you know that the show is a multiple season arc. Um, so yeah, it's been really odd. And then you've also got like the the volume of the fans and just the eyes on the show in general, which I haven't had before, which has been a, a really rare thing for me, especially with like a 10 year career mm-hmm. where I feel like, I've been able to do such varied and cool work that I've been really proud of, but I've never, you know, been like popular <laughs> amongst like, <laughs> I don't know, like it, it's never been zeitgeisty. Mm-hmm. Um, and so like, yeah, walking down the street for a little bit was a bit of a different experience, which yeah. just sent me into an absolute <laughs> just turmoil. Um, but now it's okay. No, yeah, it's a bit better. That's good. <laughs> uh, I was actually going to ask, you know, how uh, this marathon of talking about a performance that you already did has sort of shifted your your how you how you work as an actor. You know, how 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 constantly returning and talking about something that you already did uh, has sort of shifted your viewpoint of of how you do approach characters and and how you prepare for them and things like that. I think. Well, I think it's not made me reassess how I prepare for a character or how I um, talk about a character. It's just whatever I imbue the character with, whatever layers I try to give the character in order to make a more nuanced performance. When you talk about that, ultimately, it's not going to please everyone. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's just what I have to do in order to give a decent, honest performance. Um, I have to imbue it with just things that justify the character's actions and emotions and those might not necessarily be in the original text or even in the script but creating a backstory is so vital um for me and then you talk about it and then um you know because it doesn't necessarily fit with the with the original text, even though it's all been signed off and you've spoke about it at length with all the creatives and your fellow actors, it still causes fury and uproar with certain people, which you just can't help. And, you know, you do want to talk about your process, but it sort of, it pops the bubble a bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, that is, um, Probably first and foremost, the challenge of this very podcast is, you know, I, I, after talking to so many actors, it, I almost get the sense that if you talk about it too much, it, it, the, the worry is that something will go away, you, you know, mm. and it, it almost has to be like, you, 
it almost has to be like I don't understand where that's coming from. Is, does that make sense? It's 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 it, it has to be that for you to then be very analytical about it. Yeah, and also you have to give space for an audience's interpretation and for them mm-hmm. to project whatever they need or want to project onto the character, which makes them have a better experience watching the show. Um, and also you still want to have a bit of like ses- sexy mystique yeah. around the performance. And then a lot of it is me analysing my own performance after the fact where... Mm-hmm usually I've just done stuff because it felt right and it just came from my my gut. And then then you're asked a question and really a lot of it is me making stuff up on the fly because I've been yeah. like, God, I really don't know why I did, yeah. it. I did it. Um so yeah, you're sort of analysing yourself <laughs> um as well as the character simultaneously. Yeah, I, that, that's something I've always been interested in, you know, talking to actors where it's like, and especially for, for a role that requires this much press, uh, myself included in the press. Mm-hmm. I'm curious, like, how many of the same muscle, is there overlap there between, you know, like performance and press? Is is the, the vulner, vulnerability of acting versus the vulnerability of doing an interview and talking about acting? Are are, are there overlaps in, you know, skills and muscles and, 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 and when it comes to doing an interview where it almost becomes a adjacent performance yeah it's so funny because like i've developed a muscle within this industry where i don't really feel that much shame sorry i'm in such a noisy house it's very (laughs) echoey um i don't feel really that much shame or embarrassment when it comes to performing but having to answer questions about myself as myself is just is such a different experience yeah. and you feel so under the microscope and then i don't know like there's such a like a wave of self-loathing that comes along with that um where i think a lot of us actors we're really doing this just to escape ourselves mm-hmm. um and you know the the other side of this industry is that you can't because there is an element of you, fame and celebrity that unfortunately you have to invite in Mm -hmm. even in the smallest of ways you know i'm sure there's people you know like daniel day lewis still has to do the odd the odd interview yeah i mean i don't know if i've ever seen daniel day lewis like sitting in a junket but like it 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 always comes with it and it's so interesting i've seen him do like a q and a yeah, I, it's it, there are levels to it for sure, but I mean it's 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 so interesting because I talk to so many actors and one of the most common themes is they say, you know, I was a shy kid, I was so shy I couldn't even I couldn't even you know order at a restaurant, and it's like, well, you picked a very strange profession, but there is something there, like you mentioned, it's it's a different thing between performing as yourself and performing as a character. I think that's a little easier to to disappear into a character than it is to disappear into an interview. Yeah, and I was, I can't remember what show I was watching, but they did an experiment on an actor's brain and there is something that changes Mm -hmm. in their, on a just, on a molecular level where they do, there is like a sort of severance between self Mm -hmm. and character, which I thought was amazing. There is like a fantasy land that you can tap into and you do become someone else. And again, it's like that's fascinating and it's incredible to hear. But I think if if anybody understood it too much, <laughs> then the then the that weird alchemy, of, that process of of getting there would be harder. Yeah, yeah, no, exactly. Yeah, there is. Yeah, there is an element of just suspending everything mm-hmm. and not intellectualizing it too much. Absolutely. So you know, when we look back at this this year, the obvious gigantic thing as we have mentioned as we've alluded to is house of the dragon um i've read that you did a fair amount of auditions for this role um how many auditions for this role and when was that happening sort of you know in relationship to other work you're doing how were you sort of doing this on the side auditioning for the show in in terms of what you were also working on so it conveniently coincided with the pandemic so it was august 2020 I stupidly in in November 2019 was like, 
oh my god I've worked so much this year I'm, <laughs> I'm in New York I need to move back to London I need to like put all my stuff in storage and I'm just going to take a couple of months off just to do that and find a place in London move to London and then um a month later the pandemic hit mm -hmm. and so by that point it was coming up on a year of not working so i was starting to panic just <laughs> slightly um and then yeah this came through and i hadn't seen the original game of thrones which i think worked in my favor because i was given i auditioned for rhaenyra first and mm -hmm. i can't remember what's i think we were given some dummy sides and then they wanted me to audition for alicent which were um cersei's a, Cer a Cersei scene from Game of Thrones, mm -hmm. um, which is which she's played by Lena Lena Headey. If no, if you haven't seen the Game of Thrones before, but if I had, I would have completely mimicked her entire performance. Did you know so, that that's what those were? Or no, did you... it was only when I got the job and uh -huh. I was watching. I was you know doing my homework and watching Game of Thrones, and I was like, "Why does this sound so familiar?" This <laughs> scene, and I was like, "Oh." Um, and thankfully, like, I think we did play it very differently. But, you know, I think she's so brilliant that I would have definitely been so influenced by her. Um, but, yeah, so then I auditioned, so I auditioned for Rhaenyra, then auditioned for Alison, then back to Rhaenyra. And then in the middle of that, spoke to Miguel and Ryan, the the showrunners, uh, Miguel Sapochnik and Ryan Condal. And they w were sort of like coaching me on how to get the job and basically saying really nicely, like, the job is yours. We want you. You know, we've just got to convince, you know, the mm -hmm. higher ups. Um, and then auditioned once more for Alison. And then didn't hear anything until I got a phone call saying they want to put you on hold, which means, you know, they're going to pay you a little bit to not get another job. Mm -hmm. And in that, at that point, I was like, treat. And so it was like a beautiful window in in our government and your and the the European travel laws where we could fly to destinations. And so mm -hmm. I flew to Sicily and had a week long holiday. Um, thank you, HBO. And <laughs> then, and then, yeah. So it was like from that point on, which was like early September. I didn't find out until end of. October that I got the job so it's a big long process and like you you make time you make space and you make time for it in your head mm -hmm. and you're thinking about this character so in depth um at that point and I don't yeah it's it's a really weird competitive mode that you get in even though you don't know who mm -hmm. you're competing against it could be you're anyone competing against the industry uh, yeah, know, exactly. In, yeah. In general, <laughs> um, when you're when you're doing that many auditions, you know, for the same role, do you? Is it more of a? Are you trying to replicate the last one because you know it went well, or are you trying to build on what came before it? Well, they're giving you. They gave me different um, scenes to do each time, so it was more just how can I make a through line with what I've already done and what they liked and mm -hmm. also show off different colors of my interpretation of this character. Um, but it's so hard when you're doing self tapes with your best mate against mm -hmm. a, you know, a white wall and a ring light and you've not got costume or hair and makeup, which, you know, is so much a part of that world. So you're really like, really asking them to suspend belief for, mm -hmm. for um for you know two minutes 30 seconds or however long the self-tape is yeah but how much of a during this process how much of a a take you know like a, a firm solid take on the character do you have or is it or is it really just that work can't start until until later yeah i think i think i had a guttural north star which was probably the same throughout but in terms of like what made the character tick and what justified the actions i hadn't even begin began to mm -hmm. to color in i hadn't given her a backstory and also you know 
I think I'd read maybe two scripts at that point, but like a little bit later into the audition process. And I hadn't read Fire and Blood. I hadn't watched any Game of Thrones. And it's almost for me, as I get closer to a job, I want less and less to do with it just because I don't want to get my hopes up. Mm -hmm. um, if that makes sense. No, it makes, <laughs> makes sense <laughs> to me. I completely get that. And I'm curious, once you mentioned you, they, they, they finally gave you the call and they're like, you, you, after all this, the role is yours. Um, what is that conversation like? And then like, what is the immediate next step? Is there is there a, 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 some breathing room or is it, okay, the role is mine. Now I'm allowed to, uh, do, you, do you allow yourself ownership over the role at that point? Yeah, it was like late. It was quite late in the evening. It was like eight or nine. And then you get a call and I was crouched by the plug because my phone was on charge. <laughs> and I saw like my manager's phone number and I was like, hmm. And it was his assistant that was like, hi, I've got, you know, re you know, reams off like 17 names. Um, and so like, okay. And, and then they're all screaming down the phone being like, you know, you've got the job, it's yours. And they were all such massive Game of Thrones fans. So I think it may, it meant at the time way more to them <laughs> than it did to me. And so I felt, you know, I felt really elated and also like happy that I'd made them proud. <laughs> um, but also just immediate dread knowing how big this job was in terms of my life and how it might potentially change and if I was ready for that. Mm -hmm. um, but I'd given it a good, I'd given it a lot of thought um, and ultimately the scripts and speaking to Miguel and Ryan and what they wanted to do with the the role and the story in general, I was just really excited about it. It just sounded like a huge challenge, something that I'd never done before. And just, just wild. Like I felt like I was about to embark on just such a wild ride that I was after, after the pandemic and months of tedium, I was ready for. Yeah. Something, uh, gigantic uh, i'm curious uh you know expectations versus reality um how much of it matched up with what you're expecting uh just now that you're on the other side of it you know how, what was what was surprising to you what was the what was the thing that remained true the entire time what was the the, the that that moment of oh man i'm gonna embark on this thing mm -hmm. um how much of it matched in, into what actually happened uh on set i knew it was gonna be big but i didn't expect like the sheer size of the sets to be as humongous and as meticulously crafted as they were. They built um, the Red Keep, which is the castle in the original Game of Thrones that's in Westeros, but they, they built the entire the entire castle within one stage at Leavesden. And so it was completely practical. You could walk through the, the courtyard, you could walk up the stairs, you could go around the corridors into the Queen's apartments, back out into the King's apartments, into Otto Height, the Hand of the King's room, and then back down the stairs into the kitchens and then into the small council chambers. It was just mm -hmm. wild. It was it was amazing. It was just, it proper felt like you were in a museum. Um and then the costumes were so beautiful and the hair and makeup was so stellar. And, you know, you're all of a sudden in a scene and everyone's so opulently dressed and you're <laughs> with, you know, some of the, the best actors that you've grown up watching mm -hmm. and some of them are in white wigs. And, <laughs> and by that point, I'd watched all of Game of Thrones and so was a humongous fan and loved the just the the law of it and it's just there is that element of just like magic dust that is sprinkled onto everything it does feel mm -hmm. it just feels so much bigger than you and then i think we slid into a really lovely like cocoon sort of mm -hmm. like an invincible invincible invisible shell was put over leaveston studios in watford and it felt like a really nurturing place where all those actors just like bonded together, sort of like bracing ourselves for impact. But also we had 10 months, so it was like a soft impact. <laughs> that, um, <laughs> that feel like it gradually built as as we went on. 
but we just felt so protected by each other and so solid in our friendships and relationships. And then, yeah, all of a sudden you're on a press tour and you're slightly fed to the wolves a little bit. Mm -hmm. Um, Especially with something like this, where I, I, I you, you touched on a bit before, you know, you, the, the goal is to not factor in too much the expectations, specific expectations of the, of the character that already exists in a different medium. And, you know, the people have a very clear idea of what she should look like and sound like. Uh, so I am curious, you know, how it, it almost feels impossible to not think about that. But when you're when you're trying to find a, a, a way into this character for you, um, at what point do you have to sort of close the door on that and, and find your emotional connection with Alison? I think luckily I didn't really invite that in until we were already on the press tour and it, and our episodes were already out. And then, you know, me and Emma obviously just looked on Twitter just to pick <laughs> the scab. And then you just, oh my God, it is, it's like your phone screaming at you. Mm -hmm. um, it's a lot of opinions and a lot to take in and, you know, realistically, mostly positive, but there are those really gross and flamboyantly evil <laughs> tweets that <laughs> that do just reverberate around your mind. They, they have things. a way of breaking through. Um, yeah. And I guess making themselves feel there. bigger than they actually are just because the fact that they broke through. <laughs> For sure. Yeah. Um, and so it's only then where you're like, oh my God, maybe, maybe the, you know, the anonymous person who sent that tweet is right. And <laughs> not the person who spent two years thinking about the character. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, you, you know, inevitably to look at that stuff, you're inviting it in. And so you must shut that door um, in order to do your job. Mm -hmm. It's just so unhelpful. And um, the people that you need to invite in when it comes to this character and this story are George R. Martin, Ryan Condal, Sarah Hess, the two writers, like our amazing directors, Claire Kilner, Geeta, you know, those are the people that you want to believe and trust and need to believe and trust. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, because I you can't really go along with Twitter fan fiction. Yeah, I think that is a generally <laughs> healthy <laughs> just 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 not use that as a sounding board. Yeah. Um, For your awards consideration, The White Lotus, the Emmy award-winning HBO original series is a sharp social satire following the exploits of hotel guests at an exclusive Sicily resort whose stay becomes affected by their various dysfunctions. Praised by Vanity Fair for its magnetic performances and Rolling Stone for its intoxicating allure, don't miss what British Vogue calls the perfect comedy. The White Lotus is now streaming on HBO Max. You did mention this a bit, how the highlight of the of this entire press tour was just uh, you and Emma talking. Uh, it, it was very clear how well you both got on. And I think that translates, obviously, on screen. Uh, I'm curious, you know, I get a lot of different answers about the concept of chemistry and what it means uh, to have it, what it means to build it. So I'm curious from, from your standpoint, you know, how important it is to, to have that sort of real, um, real life chemistry and how that factors into how it helps with, with on a scene to scene basis, or, or, mm -hmm. or is that another part of acting where it, you kind of have to find it uh, between your characters and your, and your real life self. I think I think it helped that when we first met, it was just so immediate. And yeah, I just love them so much. It's just, it's just so easy. Mm -hmm. And we didn't really have to work at that. We just wanted to be around each other. Um, but I also think you can fake chemistry as well. You know, I've done jobs where maybe it wasn't there initially or in real life and you do once you like tap into that character you can sort of like fudge it a little bit um but it just having that natural rapport really just makes your job and your life so much easier mm -hmm. um, it's like you know any workplace environment if you get on with the person that you're working with you're just like oh phew you know life is just that little bit 
brighter and more colourful rather than, you know, knowing that you're going into work with a bit of a slog Mm -hmm. on your hands trying to make something work. And and we've also just got a really good second hand as well. And we've we've got very similar opinions about our job and then our characters and and how we like to operate in a in a space and what sort of actors we are we've, we're sort of very similar so that always helps you know neither of us are very method mm-hmm. uh, we can break and have a laugh and then just tap into it again right back into which it is yeah. so nice they're my favorite favorite actors who's just having <laughs> having a laugh and a joke one second and then action calls and they're just laser beaming right mm-hmm. into your soul um so that's really lovely. Um, but, you know, like it's so not a given and I had no idea that that would be the case. But I'm so thankful it is. And, you know, that's that's part and parcel with a casting director's job. They've got to call mm-hmm. and do their homework and see, you know, actually, and I think they did that on this. They did their homework and to see who's like, you know, a good person and who's, you know, yeah. have around. Mm-hmm. It's a long job if someone is a bit of an arsehole. <laughs> I mean, that's that's every industry, but I assume you know, with acting, you have to. You're, you're in so many vulnerable uh, scenarios with them. It, it just helps to have a person that you that you trust because acting is so much of it is trust. Yeah, um, yeah. I I do want to ask. You know, I think a, a good way to sort of get into uh, specifics on how how you approach creating this character and what it was like to film the show. So just ask about some specific moments mm. uh, from the show and just you know what it was like on set that day, how you prepared for it, uh, stuff like that. Uh, the first sort of standout moment for me is that you know I think it was episode seven. Um, there is that confrontation between you and Emma that 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 ends with the the, the big knife confrontation. Um, it's a very mm. charged moment, but it's a very it kind of feels like one of the first big um, points of no return in the show. So I'm, I'm curious how, what the conversations were like, um, how you wanted to play it, what you wanted to play and what you didn't want to play in that moment. Mm. Well, for me and for my character, I felt like, I thought it was so simple <laughs> <laughs> that, that my, my son has just lost an eye because, and I don't know the, I don't know going into it that my son had been incredibly antagonistic towards these children and now has this big drag. I didn't know any of that had happened. All I know is that I'm sitting in front of my son and one of his eyes is gone. Mm -hmm. And so her kids should be reprimanded. And then to see my husband, who I also share these children with, favorite his daughter, Rhaenyra, who used to be my childhood friend, in order for the, in lieu of just the visual facts in front mm-hmm. of us, I think it all going in going into that scene, it all felt really simplistic. Like I've been publicly rejected, and so have my children, and there are consequences to these actions, which he's not going to do because he's chosen her instead of me and our, our our children. And so she does just crack. This is just the final straw for her over, you know, a decade's worth of being snubbed in favor for her and being an afterthought and also just living a life of servitude. She had no choice in any of this. She wasn't allowed to pick or choose a husband. Mm-hmm. Um, she had children when she was still a child. And I think this, yeah, she just snaps. She just, she just snaps. It's a mental break. And I think for her, it's one of those moments where everything just goes black and you don't realise you're doing these things until she looks down and Rhaenyra's arm's bleeding mm-hmm. and she drops the knife. Um, and so that's how I played it. And And Emma had a very different approach to it and a very different justification, but it's all it's still under the umbrella of a mother's love Mm -hmm. and protecting her own. Um, And also she's protecting the legitimacy of her children as well, which for my family and for the rest of the kingdom, in terms of the whispers that are happening in and around the castle, it's very obvious that these are not 
her husband's children. Mm-hmm. That's such an interesting thing to play. I, I have to imagine is is playing or making the conscious decision to play a moment where your character is not making a conscious de- decision. Mm. Does, does that make sense? And that's 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 really interesting. I'm I'm just curious, you know, how you do that. <laughs> not, again, I don't know. I think we were both. I mean, we shot that over five days, mm-hmm. and so I think by the end of it, we were just running on fumes anyway. Mm-hmm. So that helped. Um, but it's a, it's a weird thing where you just, um, I don't know, I do, sometimes with those high, high, and it sounds really woo-woo, which I'm not particularly, but you do just sort of like lose consciousness with your own self and, mm-hmm. and you are, you, you are just, you are just Alison. Yeah, um, you get to that place, whatever that you, place is. Yeah. And you, and it's just like a really super charged high level of focus i guess Mm -hmm. that helps you have the engine to do that and yeah it was all emotions were so high for five days anyway that (laughs) by 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 day five emma and i were like setting up for a close shot of the knife and emma's eye and we were just in hysterics <laughs> laughing. We just, we had lost the plot, just could not keep it together. We were so tired. We had nothing left. Like mm-hmm. I was drinking so much water because just I had, I couldn't cry anymore. I was so dehydrated. Um, Yeah, it was just, just madness. A lot of that, that was our first big emotional scene that lasted over a few days. And we were both like, oh, fuck. This is gonna this job. We've got ten months of it, and it's gonna require a lot of a lot yeah. of stamina. It's all gonna be like this. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, what have we done? What have we signed up for? Um, the 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 second sort of the specific moment I think is honestly like my favorite piece of acting in the show. Um, it's the moment where you're in the carriage with your son. You know, you finally found him, and he asked you, "Do you love me?" And the response is, uh, "You imbecile." But there's so much in those two words it's almost like that acting exercise you know like make make something mean something else just by the way you say it Mm -hmm. uh i'm curious how many versions of that delivery uh, it took to to sort of get that much meaning into words that you're not saying what you what you mean well that was that was a really last minute addition that wasn't in the script and we'd 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 done the scene a few times and then sarah and Claire came up to the carriage and and said to Tom, "Just ask her if if you if if she loves you." And then Sarah was like, "Just reply with some something like you know like some something like you you imbecile or we had I did something else." And so really, it was only like two or three takes of that, but all of a sudden the scene just shifted into something much more intimate and mm-hmm. meaningful and something that we hadn't seen in their dynamic, which has always been so antagonistic. And yeah, to imbue, because basically he's asking, why have you done all this for me? And you imbecile in turn is being like, because you are my son. I've done all of this for you. Everything that I do, everything I live for is for my children and for you. And yeah, it just, it, even though even though he had just raped the servant girl and I had had to clean up all his mess and he's run away from the castle and been found and been brought back and cleaned up and he's still hung over severely in his coronation. I'm still doing all this because I love you so much because you're my son and I cannot break that. No, as as much as Alison probably wants to. Um, so yeah, it just felt so much more layered, but also just there was such a sadness that came to it as well. Just these two broken people about to change the course of history, and mm-hmm. for why, really, why none of them, both of them, don't want to do it. They just think they should. It's it's kind of like it, you kind of touched on it. It's it's exactly what you want from dramatic writing, dramatic acting, where where you can take all of that and put it into two lines that are like what like 
three words each and but you get you get all of it just from the mm. performance the writing and it's it's it was just really impressive and then it leads into uh probably the biggest you know set piece of the entire season which was you know the the dragon sort of bursting into the coronation uh it is that 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 moment that this show you know almost has to have it's the the spectacle it's it's the big cgi moment but it doesn't really work unless you know you sell it, you know, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's more on the, the, the physical actor's reaction. So I'm curious, you know, when you're filming something like that, um, how you get to a place where that, that selling of the CGI spectacle feels real for you. Or do you get to that place? Or does it, does it never really You do get to that place because in reality, you're being blown to bits by a big wind machine and there's like dust and dirt just kicking back up in your face and you're looking at a tennis ball. And so you really have to like almost roll your eyes into the back of your imagination and go somewhere else. Um, and thankfully it did. I think that physicality of, of like physically trying to to put myself between Egon and Renice helped. Um, and I just, yeah, I mean, all, all I think all Alison can think about there is like we're dead, we're dead, we're dead, and maybe me putting myself in front of my son will char him a little bit less. But ultimately, we're absolutely incinerated, um, and especially for them who have been who have grown up around dragons all their lives, but as high towers, especially they don't ride and to, and I think Alison has always been a bit fearful of the, the dragons. And then to put yourself in front of a beast in order to protect your son is just another show of this stupid undying love she has for this just wreckhead, just absolute miscreant, yeah does it does it help to have that very amongst all of this you know there is that very that very human movement you, you do it's 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 her putting herself in front of her son does it help to like have that to lock onto to it's, it's kind of like a, a life raft in the in the ocean is is well i know that I, I can understand doing this it's harder to understand the dragon in front of me but i know stepping in front of why she's doing that yeah, it's also like simultaneously like taking stock of all her children, like pushing Kristen mm -hmm. Cole, even though Kristen Cole is my swan protector, so he leaps to my defense, but it's shoving him towards Helena. Eamon's fine, probably. He'll just do what he does yeah. and just leave him <laughs> to it because he's too scary. And then also like Egon, who is just so inefficient, but ultimately my first baby boy. Mm -hmm. Um and she does believe that the kingdom is reliant on him because of the misread of Viserys's prophecy on his deathbed because there's about 10,000 Egons and she just thinks it's hers. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's just... <laughs> it's almost like she's just trying to keep everyone happy and keep the realm happy. And she's just so, so stretched thin. Um, and I think if she was able just to have like an hour to herself to think about actually what would be the best case scenario for everybody, um, I don't know if that would be the way she turns, but then we might not have a show. Yeah. Ultimately. <laughs> well, I was, I, I was going to ask, you know, as as we're in this sort of in between period between seasons, um, do you do you like to 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 think about Alice? You know, do you like to think about where she is, what she's, what what what's happening? Do you like to find new new layers, or do you prefer to sort of leave her alone for a while, or, or I would set love her to leave her alone. I would love to, but for some reason, like she's like she's made space in my mental real estate, and so it's like. <laughs> I do end up thinking of like going on quite tangential um, daydreams in my head where I just think about ne next season and and how to play that and um, and what 
maybe the situation she's put in next and and also like how because I, I don't I haven't seen any scripts yet so I don't know what her reaction would be to um to Rhaenyra's son being killed by aim and 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 then also you know I've, I've read the book so I know about blood and cheese and and which I'll I won't give any spoilers but mm. it's it's just there's so much that is gonna there, there's so much that has to happen next season that it it I feel like I have to almost prepare myself mm -hmm. for it now yeah. um yeah you Which, wish that you know, she would leave you alone you know <laughs> it's, it's, yeah it's, yeah it's like yeah. a like a, yeah it's like a ghost um it does take up a lot because also you know now it has done so well which is amazing there is an added pressure mm -hmm. of keeping up that momentum and also wanting to do the best job you possibly can in order to serve the serve the role and the the stories and the writing and yes it's a lot it's a lot <laughs> it sounds, yeah. sounds like a lot yeah well we can worry about that in the new year you know we have, this, we have this, yeah exactly. right now um well as we you know we're sort of winding down here uh this was this was lovely thank you so much for being here of course um i just want to ask uh real quickly we do this thing called the backstage five which is for the magazine it's it's five quick questions uh whatever pops into your head first uh that is your answer does that sound good to you yeah, yeah, let's do it. Um, yeah, question number one is uh, whether or not you remember who was the casting director who gave you your first break. Um, yes, uh, Beverly Keogh. And that was on? That was in Manchester, um, and that was on a BBC drama called Blackout. I played Christopher Eccleston's daughter. Amazing. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you to them. <laughs> thank um, you. Yeah, thank you, Bev. Um. Question number two, with all the roles that you've played in your career, um, which one do you think shaped you to the most as an actor? Oh, that is so they, hard. they do get a little harder as they go. Um, I, what shaped me the most, I think maybe Amanda in Thoroughbreds, mm -hmm. uh, directed by Corey Finley, just because like, I was able to stretch a muscle that I've never been able to stretch before and play like a proper character and made me really cement the love that I have for for acting even more um and it was just a, a really wild take that at 22 he really trusted me just to run with mm -hmm. I loved it I loved it so much it was so fun playing a person that has no feelings mm -hmm. but has to pretend at feeling all the time Absolutely. Um, question number three, what is one mistake you've made in your career that you promised you would never make again? Oh, oh probably getting Instagram, but then I got it again. <laughs> That's Just I was like, my kitchen needs doing ultimately. Yeah. I mean, keeping it to one social media is, is honestly impressive. So I, I do applaud you. Oh, well, thank you. I hate <laughs> it. I hate it. And I hate myself when when i have to do stuff on it and feed the beast <laughs> yes, exactly <laughs> um question number four do the best directors you've worked with have a common way of going about their job yeah they make you feel like you came up with the best ideas when really they came up with the best ideas and so you feel great doing everything um but really they're just incredibly humble and generous and incredible at reading people as mm -hmm. well and also has the the wherewithal to let you you know run through all your ideas and then they go yeah great 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 because sometimes all an actor wants to do is just be like okay i've been thinking about this all night and like here's like x y and z why i think this is going to happen or mm -hmm. i think my character does this and maybe it doesn't pertain to the scene that you're doing exactly but they will make you think that you're able to incorporate that in what they want you to do which you know sometimes it doesn't necessarily get in but you feel emboldened and and mm -hmm. confident in that anyway you got it out of your head so it, it exactly yeah yeah it's like that. letting off steam mm -hmm. 
And um, question number five, were you ever surprised at how the audience perceived one of your characters? Yeah, I guess with House of the Dragon, I, I mean, I think people have really set her up to be the villain, but I just don't think she is at all. And I, and I mean, number one, you, I think it'll be incredibly short-sighted to play any character like a villain. Mm -hmm. um, but I just think there's so much, there's so much empathy that I have with her um, that, and I think she's incredibly antagonistic at times, but I can't, I just don't see her as that, that black and white villain that I think mm -hmm. a lot of people see her as. Amazing. Well, Olivia, thank you so much. This was this was lovely. This was, was great. It? Uh, yeah, absolutely. We did it. We got there. You know, nothing went horribly wrong. Uh, in, in fact, it was wonderful. Uh, so oh, thank you thank so much you. for being here. Uh, maybe maybe we'll see you again in another year. We'll make this a, yeah. a, a reoccurring bit. Yeah, that'd be great. See where I am now, probably just in a heap. Of <laughs> Amazing. Well, thank you so much. Thanks, Vinny. Have a nice day. Thanks, as always, to our brilliant producer, Jamie Muffet, and to the whole team at Backstage, Samantha Sherlock, Mark Stinson, Caitlin Watkins, and of course, Casey Howe. Visit Backstage.com, and don't forget, you can subscribe to Backstage with code ENVELOPE at checkout for a free trial. 100% free, you simply cannot beat that. For more exclusive content, find us on Facebook and Twitter at In The Envelope, and subscribe, share, and leave a comment. Who should we interview next? Let us know. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time for another peek in the envelope.